Well, hey, th thanks everyone for coming to our uh, Institute for Addiction uh, Science Speaker Seminar Series. This is our second speaker, and we are really excited to have Dr. Dr. Richard Miak from the University of Michigan. Um, let me give you a, a little bit of background about Dr. Miak. Um, so uh, he is a sociologist by, well, actually, I'm going to reverse it. He, he is from Santa Monica originally. And then he went to Stanford uh, and had a bachelor's in sociology. Um, so he wasn't very smart, obviously. And then he went to UNC Chapel Hill to get his PhD in sociology, which actually I know is an extremely good sociology program because one of our former staff uh, people is, is in their social program. So, um, yeah. Uh, and then he, uh, he got a master's in public health at Hopkins and did some postdoctoral training um, you know, at the NIH and uh, University of Wisconsin, and then um, became a, uh, a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the School of Public Health and the Department of Mental Health. And then he moved over to be the chair of the Department of Health and Behavioral Sciences at University of Colorado in Denver, and was there for four, um, no, a little bit more than four years, I, said, I should say nine years. And then ever since 2013, he has been a research professor at the Survey Research Center, an institute for social research at the University of Michigan. Dr. Miak is probably one of the um, most well-cited uh, researchers in all of Southern Part of the reason is because he is PI of the U.S. Monitoring the Future study. So if you look at the number of times their uh, technical reports and have been cited, they're tens and tens of thousands of times. Because this study, as he'll tell you about, um, uh, is, I guess, a, it's a linchpin for policy uh, for the nation in terms of drug abuse prevention and identifying new trends. And... Uh, it's been around for a very long time, and Dr. Miak has had this role as the principal investigator of the Monitoring the Future study, I think for about three years, and he's already done some great things with the study, um, uh, kept some of the tradition, but it has also um, kind of stayed aligned with current trends, and collected some of the first national data on vaping, and was ahead of the trend too, um, in leading uh, MTF, Monitoring the Future, to not just think about vaping in terms of the nicotine product, but also looking at vaping cannabis, and even just kids who vape uh, um, flavors without any substances. Uh, so he's had a number of influential, influential findings in that area. Also, he's had a number of in influential papers um, in, uh, in studying other drugs of abuse, such as opioids in youth, and then previously did a lot of work in the area of uh, uh, health disparities, socioeconomic disparities, and, and trends over time. So uh, we are just really excited to have a, a wonderful researcher and great guy, Dr. Richard Miak. Well, thank you for that introduction. Mm -hmm. I'll make my coffee. Part of the love for the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here since Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I just saw the sun yesterday. I'm nice to see that, but I can't complain. I'm coming from Michigan with a whether it was much worse. Uh, one of the good things I have done with uh, Monitoring the Future, you talked about new initiatives, is I worked with Adam and Jessica to uh, help me with the assessment of vaping. And so we've added a module on Juul that is in the field now, as we speak. Our first school administration this year was on Tuesday, and uh, we are pushing ahead with that. And so we will have the first ever national estimates of Juul use in the United States, and so uh, we're looking forward to that. So today, I want to talk about the great decline <coughs> in the U.S. adolescent cigarette smoking and the consequences for adolescent drug use, uh, uh, particularly addictive drugs. And I first want to define what I mean by the great decline in adolescent cigarette smoking. So, um, it's really a remarkable public health achievement. It's the central theme of my presentation today, and it really centers on the fact that between 2000 and 2018, the percentage of 12th grade students who have ever smoked a cigarette declined from 63% in 2000 to our most recent estimate, which is 24% in 2018. 
And I want you to remember these two numbers, 63% and 44%. Because there is going to be a quiz. I'm not kidding. I'm going to ask you what those numbers are. And here is a graphical presentation of the great decline in cigarette smoking. So in terms of ever use of a cigarette, it was pretty much plateaued until around the year 2000. And then it just started this gradual and steady monotonic decline. And so 2000, this is 63%. This is 24%. This is not quits. I'm just I'm reminding you of those numbers. Okay? And uh, that's 12th grade and 10th grade. You see something very similar. The overall premise is a little lower, thankfully, because uh, kids don't start smoking until they're older. Uh, and then in 8th grade, you see the same thing. Uh, it actually start a little bit earlier in 8th grade. Right? That's when you first see this decline. And then about two years later, you see the 10th grade. And then about two years later, you see the 12th grade. So it's you know classic pattern of the cohort effect. Now when you're looking at population patterns with smoking, it usually starts uh, when there's changes, it starts in the younger grades. Okay. So what drove this great decline? Who knows? Why why did this happen? Was it just luck? Just coincidence? What can we attribute it to? Oxygen, taxation. Taxation? Okay. Anything else? Yes, I agree with that. I would say more generally. There was the Master Tobacco Settlement Agreement of 1998, which included some of these policy changes. In particular, um, major tobacco companies agreed to pay $205 billion over the next 25 years uh, since 1998, which I think funds t corps right? Um, part of it, anyway. Um, so there's that. Um, included in the Master Tobacco Settlement Agreement was uh, restrictions on advertising, sponsorship, and lobbying activities targeting you. This advertising, and this is billboard advertising, um, TV advertising, it didn't cover social media, right? Because it didn't exist at the time. So that may ideally need to be updated at uh, some point in the future. Uh, but also created something called the National Public Education Foundation to create national media campaigns to prevent smoking that has since been renamed to the Truth Initiative, but its roots come back here in the Mass uh, Tobacco Settlement Agreement of 1998. There was also substantial payments to the U.S. states to implement their own additional anti-smoking programs. And so you look at this, and this is quite a substantial policy change, right? And you saw that decline in smoking, it looks like it really had an effect. So really remarkable public health issue. So uh, what have been the consequences of this great decline for use of other drugs, right? And today, I'm going to present a triptych. The triptych comes you know, from Europe. Usually three things, uh, that three pieces of art that are linked to a common theme. Mine is going to be <coughs> marijuana. And then I'm going to look at the effect of the great decline on other major drugs, prescription drugs, like uh, opioids, uh, amphetamines, uh, stimulants. And then finally, I'm going to talk about vaping. And, uh, I should tell you, though, that uh, I think this presentation, if I think it starts off really strong with uh, marijuana. I think it gets even stronger with this, and then kind of peters out with it. So I don't, just so you know. <laughs> uh, this actually is a paper that I've published. This is a paper that I've been working on for a while, and it's about ready to be submitted for publication. And this is just a uh, initial thinking out loud kind of idea. Right? Um, and so this middle one, I am at the, at the stage where I really welcome any feedback that you might have. I, your general reactions, right? Like you think that's stupid. I, I need to hear that now, right? Because that will help me prevent a few rounds of review with the journal, right? If I hear this stuff. Um, like this, I don't, I don't, I'm not open to feedback because I'm going to publish it. So, but, but this, I would love to hear feedback. Well, if you have comments on other places to go, and that's that, that's fine. Okay, so. The first part of the trip said, the mystery of marijuana prevalence. Why hasn't it increased? That's a big question that was on the minds of many people. And the reason is, there was a big argument that we shouldn't legalize marijuana because of its potential influence on children and adolescents. This was perhaps the major argument against marijuana legalization. Really, a lost out, right? It's here in California. But this was the other. And the argument is that 
if you legalize marijuana, you will come to see it as safe. And as a consequence of that, marijuana prevalence among youth will consequently increase. <coughs> and so that all sounds straightforward, but let me be very, very careful about this. Um, and also, I should say, so as marijuana prevalence increases, so too does addiction and dependence. So uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they came out, this is from like 2000, I think, eight. They were against the legalization of marijuana. And like I said, their major rationale was that it would have a negative impact on youth. And so they say we're against it. Uh, and uh, their argument was, just to reiterate, is that legalization sends a signal to youth that the government says that it's okay, it's like alcohol, that's fine, it's recreation. And <coughs> it's not about availability. I really want to emphasize that because lots of times you talk to people about legalization and say, oh yeah, the problem with legalization is that it's going to be more accessible to youth now, right? Um, but uh, that's not a very strong argument against legalization when it comes to youth. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So here is a graph of marijuana use, marijuana prevalence among 12th graders from 1975 all the way up to 2013. And uh, if you extend it to 2018, it would be pretty flat here. Okay. And here, overlaid on top of this graph, is availability. So we asked 12th graders, we've asked them for the last 44 years, if you wanted to get your hands on marijuana, how difficult would it be for you to get that? Would it be very difficult? Or would it be really, um, really easy, right? And more than 80% of all 12th graders since 1975 said if they wanted to get marijuana, it would be easy to get it, right? So marijuana prevalence has gone up and down over the years, but availability has been very constant. So this is not a very good prediction of that. This is just basically a constant. And this is going up and down. Something else is driving this other than availability. And that's where we get to the whole signal hypothesis, right? That is sending the signal to you. So, marijuana use tracks poorly with perceived availability. It does track much better with a measure that we call perceived risk, which is, here's the exact text of the question, how much do you think people risk harming themselves physically or in other ways if they use marijuana regularly? So let's see how that tracks with marijuana prevalence. And here we see a real nice inverse relationship, right? So as perceived risk goes up, marijuana prevalence goes down. As uh, perceived risk goes down, marijuana prevalence goes up. It's like you could put a mirror here, right? And they would uh, be mirror images of each other. And this is kind of a whole signal hypothesis that I was talking about earlier, where if Legalization leads kids to think, oh, well, maybe it's not that bad, maybe there's not that much risk from using marijuana. Then maybe well, they're going to start using it more. And I should say, you know, this perceived risk, we find in monitoring the future that when, when perceived risk changes, it's the next year that the prevalence will change accordingly. So when perceived risk goes down the next year, typically the prevalence goes up and vice versa. And we've looked at other measures too, like disapproval of marijuana use. Do you disapprove of kids who use marijuana use? And that doesn't work as well, right? That's more, that seems almost like once you use marijuana, that changes your disapproval of it. But this seems to be a much better predictor of perceived risk of future marijuana use. So could you say that that decline is secondary to the like Reagan era say no to drugs? Which one? This one here? Yeah. Um, transposed on the 80s. I would say it took place during that era. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And we, and, and we would say, it looks like, perhaps, that that kind of campaign to just say no to drugs probably was associated with an increase in the perceived risk, right? With the kids growing up in that era, uh, came to think, well, maybe marijuana use isn't okay, right? If Nancy Reagan is on TV, it's bad. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a good historical context. Okay, so um, this previous graph that I just showed you here, this was actually published in pediatrics, and American Academy of Pediatrics used that as the justification for its stance against legalization of marijuana. They used NTF data. And so this evidence was quite consistent 
that graph only goes up to uh, 10 years ago. So what's happened since then, right? If this is their basis to be against legalization of marijuana, well, unfortunately, what we see is that perceived risk is now very low. Since the last time this graph was published in pediatrics, perceived risk is at, can I say, yeah, I think I can say it's at the lowest level we've ever seen in the history of monitoring the future, right? So uh, we would expect, therefore, right, if this inverse relationship has continued, we would expect prevalence to just skyrocket, right? To come up there, to be the highest that we've ever seen. That's what I was expecting, right? But it didn't. It's kind of level, basically, right? So this gets back to the question I asked previously, the mystery of the prevalence of marijuana use. If perceived risk has gone down so much, how come marijuana prevalence has been pretty much steady? How come it's been pretty much flat? Now, I'm not the only one who had this question. Um, People who also asked me include Nora Volkov, who is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, who funds our study. I meet with her once a year for our press release, and she said, she said, I won't do the invitation of Richard. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Richard, why hasn't this increased? And at the time, when she first asked me, I was like, well, you know, hand and haw, I'm like, well, it must be something else, a uh, competitor or something. <laughs> And then Michael Monticelli, he was the drug czar at that time. He asked me, the next drug czar, or, or the previous one, the skill, Kalikowski, they also asked me, and I didn't really have a very good answer. And this was like, this is where we hung our hats, Mom, to the future. We said, this is really the important thing. Why hasn't, why, what's happening? Are we in a new era right now where prevalence has somehow been disconnected from perceived risk? I mean, what's, well, how do you explain that? Right? Should we be asking new questions? Should we, change our approach. So um, this mystery is the kind of issue that could potentially be debated by academics for decades. You can come up with different hypotheses, right? I'm happy to say I have the definitive answer. <laughs> you're going to walk out of this room and you're going to say, I understand that. I know why. Because I heard this talk by Richard. Um, but first, before I give you the answer, let me tell you about the data that I'm presenting. It comes from Monitoring the Future. It's an ongoing series of surveys of American adolescents and college students and adults since 1975. Uh, we've been continuously funded since 1975, so we haven't missed any years. It's conducted by a team of social scientists at the University of Michigan. I'm the PI. Um, and it's funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It's been uh, competitively reviewed every five years. One in this room could tell you that competition is stiff, right? Uh, so we feel very fortunate that it has been continued. And the uh, important thing to know is that uh, we do uh, surveys of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, and uh, we have a list of all the 12th grades, to all, all schools with 12th graders in the United States, uh, and we have a list of all the schools with 10th graders in the United States, and we have the same list for 8th graders. And we draw separate nationally representative samples for 12th grade, 10th grade, and 8th grade. So we don't go to a school and just interview all the 12th graders and 10th graders and 8th graders. We go to one school for 12th graders, we go to a separate school for 10th graders, we go to a separate school for 8th graders. So basically, we have three separate nationally representative studies that we do every year. And if we find you know, the same finding for 12th graders, 10th graders, and 8th graders, it's almost like a replication. I think it is a replication. We have this list of all public and private schools in the United States. That's not an easy list to get. The U.S. government does not keep track of that. They keep track of all the public schools, but not private schools. You have to go to a private vendor. There are companies that keep track of this kind of stuff. They have companies because they're looking for a mailing list for teachers if they want to sell a textbook or something. So we get a list from them. Um, every year, we survey approximately, in total, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade, 45,000 surveys. So, and about 410 public schools and private schools combined. Uh, so that's a big number, 40,000. Uh, as of 2018, we've completed more than 1.5 million surveys. Uh, but actually, you know, a lot of people are impressed by the size of the survey. Like, wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of people, 45,000 people a year. 
but it's really not the size of the survey that is the value of MTF, it's the representativeness, right? And so we can say with confidence that with a <coughs> survey of 45,000 people every year, we get the same results that you would get if you surveyed all 12 million high school students in the United States, give or take a percentage point, right? This whole nationally representative sample thing, because of the way we draw our sample, where we have a list of all the schools in the United States and we took a random draw, um, we feel uh, it's because of that, uh, we feel we know that we can claim we have a representative study. And that is why we can claim that we're kind of a, a gold standard in the United States, that this is what the prevalence of drug use is in the United States for the nation as a whole. That's our main contribution to it. We have, yeah. Can, can I ask just a quick question? Sure. So for, um, for how many of the what is sort of your participation rate among schools? Like, do you often end up with schools that don't want to participate in the study, or, or what What percentage of schools that you approach actually say yes to letting you in? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, the way we do it is we have certain, uh, we have a professional sampling statistician that we hire to year round, and so they select areas of the country, um, uh, sampling units, I guess, which are county, counties sometimes, sometimes they're not. And so the, the way we report the, the, uh, the response rate is how many times did we get a school in that pre-specified area? And if you look at it that way, it's like 92%, right? In those areas where we wanted to get a school, so that would be naturally representative, it's 92%. That being said, um, about half of the schools that we contact on our first try, about half of those schools agree and half turn us down. And then the other half, we have to start going to other schools in that area, right? And so overall, the response rate is something like, I think, 40% of those schools. Yeah. And there's chap chapter three in our annual report goes into great detail about that. It's very interesting. So we report this first. So contents include, of course, prevalence of drug use. That's our bread and butter. Every year, we report for more than 50 drugs, whether prevalence among adolescents increased or whether it decreased. Basically, people are very interested in that. Um, if it. Well, actually, they're interested, the media is interested if there's been an increase in anything like they think. If there's been a decrease, nobody cares. Um, but the increases, if it bleeds, it leads. Those are of great interest. Uh, we also ask about perceived risk of drug use for pretty much all drugs. We ask about disapproval of drug use. We ask about perceived availability of drug use. We ask about demographics and family structure. We ask about religious attendance. We ask about a lot of school experiences. That's, that helps us actually get the suspicion of schools that we can report to the school principal afterwards. And we get that information on how the students are perceiving and some of their school characteristics. Um, our policy influence. We have a yearly press release uh, in December. Joint uh, with us, so I fly out to DC. And this was the year that we uh, reported on vaping. That was our big leading news, right? That in terms of nicotine vaping, we saw the largest increase of any substance that we've ever seen in the past 44 years. Um, so that was a big, was a big increase. Um, we meet with the U.S. Drug Tower when we have one. We didn't have one this December because <coughs> the Trump administration had appointed uh, one yet. Um, I want to also talk about validity of self-reports because this is a self-reported survey. So if people have questions, well, how do you believe that the kids are telling you the truth? Um, and so we have a lot of different ways to kind of assess when the kids are telling us the truth or not. We have longitudinal data. So every year in the 12th grade class, we, we select 2,500 students and we follow them up longitudinally through a panel study. So we've been around for 44 years, so we have about 43 active panel studies. First one, which was first studied in 1976. They're in the 60s now. Um, but we also have you know, more recent panel studies. And so we ask, you know, have you ever used drugs? And there's high concordance among the same people. Uh, those kids who said in 12th grade that they had used drugs continue to say that later. Those kids who said they never used drugs are more likely to use that, say that as well. Um, we find that our kids aren't very shy in peak years, more than two thirds have reported using illegal drugs of some type in their life. So they don't seem to have any inhibitions about reporting that. Um, 
in part uh, because our eighth and tenth grade surveys are anonymous. We don't ask any information whatsoever about their personal identity, who knows their name, email address, nothing. So there's no reason for them unnecessarily uh, to tell us something that's not true because it's never going to be traced back to them. In fact, sometimes parents get upset when they find out that they were their kids were in the survey, if they were in eighth and tenth grade, we say, well, we're sorry, we can't, we can't take out your students' responses, your, your kids' responses, because we don't know who they are. Uh, we don't have any information about them. Um, so anonymity helps. Um, we also go to great lengths to explain to the students in twelfth grade, where we do ask them for personal identifying information, that the information will be very, uh, very confidential. We also. Um, we asked about reports of use by unnamed friends, like have your friends been using marijuana? And that's always been a very strong predictor of marijuana use. And um, that correlates very highly, like you would expect. Um, you can look at um, construct validity for the psychologists and psychometricians in here. And um, you look at attitudes like um, perceived risk and disapproval, and those all correlate very highly. That those who have very low levels of perceived risk of marijuana much more likely to be marijuana users. So that's also evidence in support of validity of these self-reports. We also tell the kids that if there's any question you feel uncomfortable about, just don't answer it. And that being said, the missing data levels are uh, very small for specific questions, like 3%. Uh, we find hardly any of the kids skip the questions, although we encourage them to do so. Um, and also, we clean the data, so we find about 3% of our responses are what we would call jokers or clowns. You know, people report using heroin every day in the past 30 days. And then they also report they've never smoked a cigarette or, you know, just stuff that's not consistent. Or people who say they never smoked marijuana, but then somewhere else they say they smoke marijuana every day. So uh, we find that every year that's about 3% of our data, and then we just throw those people their surveys. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and finally, our bread and butter is really uh, trends over time, like I mentioned. And if you believe that these reports have some validity issues, and maybe a certain percentage of kids are not telling the truth, um, that may be the case. But as long as that bias is the same over two years, if you're looking at trends, right, the bias cancels out. Right? Any change over time as long as the bias hasn't changed, is due substantively to that particular question. Yes. Um, so we believe school surveys are the best, most economical way to monitor drug trends. Okay, so back. Just a quick question. Yes. Um, the, uh, for the 12th graders yeah. and getting the identifier, yeah. um, do, do they have to have their identifiers to participate in the 12th grade survey? No. Oh, they don't? Okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's the very it's last nice. section. I see. And if they don't want to, then they can just skip it. But that being said, uh, it used to be 90% would fill out that information. Now it's fallen to about 75%. And then you just see that over time across all surveys. It's not specific to much. Mm -hmm. But 75% will provide that information. Now we ask also for their phone number so we can text them and permission to text them. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as your email addresses and right. email addresses. And mainly to, for the, to participate in the panel study, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to the issue. Um, as you recall, we saw this substantial decline in perceived risk, and I was expecting to see, as well as many other people, a very large increase in prevalence, but it did not take place. So why is that? Here, I'm going to show you a conundrum. Right, so this is marijuana prevalence. This group of marijuana prevalence here, I, I divide it into two groups. I divide it into those who have ever smoked a cigarette. This is marijuana prevalence among those who have ever smoked a cigarette. Right? And this is marijuana prevalence among those who have never smoked a cigarette. Okay? And you might notice they're both going up. They're both increasing. Right? But now, how could that be if overall the prevalence was flat? So I'll put that overall on the same graph, right? Even though this group is increasing and that group is increasing, right? So now here comes the quiz. 
in the year 2000, what percentage of 12th graders at the beginning of the survey period, what percentage had ever smoked a cigarette? 63. 63%, right? So the majority of them were in this group here, right? And so we're all closer to the majority group, right? And then over here, what percentage had ever smoked a cigarette? 24, right? So this is like 75, 25. So now the majority of the group is in this group here, right? So both groups were increasing, like you would expect, because perceived risk has gone down. But because with the more recent cohorts, more and more of them are in this never smoked a cigarette group because of the great decline in adolescent smoking, overall prevalence has been flat over this period. That's kind of a key concept here. Does that make sense? Yeah? No? I don't know. Yeah. I'm having a brain fart or something. Okay. Yeah. So in both groups, marijuana prevalence is going up. In this group, it's going up. Uh -huh. In this group, it's going up. And you'll notice that prevalence in this group here is five times higher than it is in this group. Oh, okay. Got it. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. So more and more groups, more and more adolescents are falling into this low risk group even though the group is increasing over time. Yes. So that's your confounder of smoking? Confounder of smoking. It's the great decline in cigarette smoking, right? And so another way to look at it is, well, let's imagine, let's do a thought experiment, let's imagine that the great decline did not take place. And that today, 63% of high school 12th graders had ever smoked a cigarette, right? So we can project what marijuana prevalence would be like if, if uh, the smoking decline had not taken place, right? In which case, 63% of all 12th graders, let's imagine 63% had been ever smokers throughout the whole study period, right? So then they would be you know, kind of more than halfway between these two groups. And what you would see is that marijuana prevalence today would be the highest we've ever seen. If it hadn't been for the great decline in Alice and Sarah. So. <coughs> and I mentioned earlier that we have basically three natural representative samples. So this is 12th graders. If we can look at 10th graders, let's see if we can replicate. Let's see if there's a fluke, let's see if it's the same thing or not. What you see is that, again, in both groups, the ever smoked a cigarette and the never smoked a cigarette, there have been increases over the study period. Again, this group has prevalence about five times higher than this group. And we know that many of the adolescents shifted into this group with the more recent cohorts. And so as a consequence of that, overall marijuana use is actually a little bit lower in 2018 than it was in 2000, because so many of the 10th graders have shifted into this low prevalence group. And we can look at the projection. If it hadn't been for the great decline in adolescent smoking, well, again, we would see marijuana use would be at some of the highest levels we've ever seen. And that's all survey. marijuana use, like eating, like yes. smoking. Yes, right. Because our question is, have you used marijuana in the past, you know, about 30 days, the past year, mm -hmm. every year of time? And so it includes all those things. Mm -hmm. And we actually ask more detailed questions later if they've used marijuana, of how they used it. So that's kind of a check. Uh, so we can see, like, maybe somebody will report that they ate it uh, in an edible, but that they didn't report that earlier. But we see very little of that. So it's all inclusive in terms of our problems. And if we go to eighth graders as well, again, there's a slight increase among those who never smoked a cigarette and marijuana prevalence. Um, there's a more substantial increase from like 35 to about 50 percent in marijuana prevalence among those who have ever smoked a cigarette. But overall, there's a decline. And that decline is because so many of kids are now in this low risk group. And we can do the projection, and we can see that um, actually there would be an increase that had been for the great decline. So, uh, this is published in pediatrics. Um, and I finally have an answer when people ask me why marijuana prevalence has increased. It's all due to smoke, because there are such fewer smokers now than in the past. There's fewer 
adolescents exposed to that risk factor of smoking, which is a very strong risk factor for marijuana use. Okay. Oh, so there it is. So had it not been for the great decline of adolescent cigarette smoking, marijuana use today would be in the highest levels ever recorded. Um, the decline in cigarette smoking has pulled downward marijuana use. Um, and in my opinion, I think uh, marijuana use has probably to increase substantially in the coming years. And by that, I mean um, we see that perceived risk in marijuana is at the lowest we've ever seen. Uh, we are increasingly seeing that cigarette smoking is reaching a plateau. It can only decrease so much. And once it reaches that plateau, then it can drag down marijuana problems. Right? And so marijuana problems is free to start going up. So I expect to see that in the coming years. You heard it here. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? It's yeah. an hour or one third. Like, uh, this is really, really interesting. Yeah. And so we're hearing a lot now that like cigarettes used to be a gateway to um, uh, smoking, but they're no longer a gateway. Oh. Um, but what you're saying is uh, there probably is a causal effect of smoking on um, on, on, yeah, smoking cigarettes to leading to marijuana. Yeah, yeah. It's just it, the causal effect might be equally as strong, but it's just you're not getting exposed to cigarettes anymore. Yes. And I think that's like important because I feel like that the general cons uh, thinking in the field is that for some reason it doesn't cigarettes may not cause you to want to um, smoke marijuana, but that's not that's not true. In your data yeah, suggests that. Uh, yeah, I'm showing right. it still. If you're smoking a cigarette, yeah. you're still five times more likely to, to become a marijuana user. Mm -hmm. so Same or to use marijuana. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Question? And, and, I'll, I'll, and just, yes, I'll, I'll ask you your question. But first, I just also want to point out that there's been a lot of people, pro marijuana people, who are saying, well, look, you know, we see more and more legalization. Mm -hmm. the, it's been in the national media. Mm -hmm. And marijuana problems is not increasing. So this whole objection by the American Academy of Pediatrics, it hasn't borne out, right? And so there are there is no downside to legalizing marijuana for kids. But I think that's a little uh, misleading, right? It actually has been increasing for both those who have ever smoked and those who have never smoked. So, yeah, back to your question. I was just going to ask, so you're using the, the overall tone of prevalence. What, what does this look like when you start looking at heavy, you know, daily users? Frequent users, right. weekly users, yeah. this whole analysis. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't looked. Um, but the data, this data in particular, you can download it today. It's, we make it publicly available. Um, and uh, it's free. And this is it's all been de identified. Um, so I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to look at it myself. But I, 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 haven't, I haven't looked at that. Uh, the ends get smaller, of course. You know, so it would be a little more noisier. It'll jump around a little bit. What do you think? Do you think it would? Do you have any um, expectations of all the findings for turn out? I'm just curious how that risk, you know, the, the perceived risk correlates with the, you know, kind of that if it starts to look more consistent with the the, the more frequent users. I was just, I was just right. curious how that right. plays out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. So um, these results led me to my next. Uh, part of my true tech. And so I'm thinking, well, you know, if uh, smoking kind of dragged down marijuana use, what has it done for the other drugs, kind of the other major drugs that adolescents use? What about uh, amphetamines? What about tranquilizers? What about opioids? Those after marijuana and alcohol, those are the most commonly used drugs among adolescents. Um, there you go. And so, to my knowledge, the effect of the great decline in cigarette smoking on use of these other drugs has not yet been considered. And there could be an un, uh, unheralded benefit here. Right? <coughs> no, I mean, there's pretty good evidence <coughs> that, the, that the Master Tobacco Settlement Agreement led to decline in cigarette smoking. But maybe it also had these other benefits as well. recognized or considered before. And you know, it's really interesting, um, just a side note, that this uh, Master Tobacco Settlement Agreement in 1998, when I've been writing up these papers, I want to be able to cite a book 
And I want to be able to say, if you want more information about you know, kind of the context and some of the consequences and the inside story about this, read this book. Nobody has written a book on the Master and Tobacco Settlement Agreement of 1998. There haven't been any book at all. I mean, that could be an excellent book to write about its public health impact. Right? But it's not out there. Mm -hmm. so I think that's really interesting. Yeah. A Question of Intent by David Kessler? Is that leading up to it? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. A Question of Intent by David Kessler? Yeah. And it's like all leading up to this. And all leading up to it? Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. I'll look for that. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so if there's one leading up to it, then there should be another subsequent one. <laughs> like what happens? Right? Okay. So I'm going to set up two competing hypotheses here. Right. So the gateway perspective would predict that as the great decline took place and adolescent smoking subsided, that this benefit should spill over to other drugs, and these other drugs should also decline because the gateway group. Um, uh, the gateway perspective basically says that uh, once people start smoking, that puts them on a trajectory to use of other drugs. And if they never smoke, then they should never enter that trajectory. Right? And uh, the way I, I want to look at it for this paper is I want to focus on the never smoke. Okay? Um, they traditionally have very low levels of drug use. We sell that with marijuana, right? Their, their marijuana prevalence was five times small. And, um, if this never smoke group, if it maintained its low levels of drug use during the Great Decline, then it should pull down levels of drug use for tranquilizers, uh, for amphetamines, and for opioids. So why would the never smoke group maintain its low level of drug use as it grew larger uh, up to 2018? The gateway theory says there's the sequence, and if you never smoke, then you will never end up at the end of the sequence as a drug user. Um, specifically, you're less likely to experience changes in the adolescent brain. That's a big part of the gateway theory, right? That makes you more receptive and sensitive to substance use. Also, another part of the gateway theory is that you're less likely to develop a social identity as a drug user. Uh, less likely to be invited to parties, for example, where it's known the drug use is going to take place. Now, the competing hypothesis is the liability perspective which is more of a psychological perspective. And it would predict, contrary to the gateway hypothesis, that maybe adolescent use of other drugs will increase as cigarette smoking declines. So the idea here is that there's a subset of adolescents who have a high propensity for general drug use, they have an addictive personality. Right? We're talking about that, right, just today. Um, and those with this propensity who do not smoke May switch to you, they may instead switch to use of other drugs, right? So during the Great Decline, smoking became stigmatized. You could get in, get tr you could get in big trouble if you got, smoke, if you got caught smoking, so they decided they're going to try something else. Right? Um, my mother is a big proponent of this. I don't know why. She, she <laughs> talked to her about it yesterday. So if kids are switching from cigarettes to some other drug, like say they're all switching to amphetamines, then you would expect and feminine prevalence to increase on this study. Okay, so um, let's look at it, okay? Same kind of general structure that I had previously. Here's amphetamine prevalence in the past 12 months by ever cigarette status. You see among those who ever smoked a cigarette, they kind of, you know, went up and down, but you know, actually at the end in 2018, it's the same as it was at the beginning. It's at 15%. Among those who never smoked a cigarette, I mean, it is low. It's like, it varies between, here is 3%, here is 3%, I think it varies between 1 and 3% the whole time. It just doesn't change, right? And so this is kind of consistent with the gateway theory, right? Because the kids who are never smoking, they're, they're not going on the drugs. It's not like they're all of a sudden switching over to the benefits. And so I'm going to look, I'm going to next present you the overall prevalence uh, during the study period. And this is, Remember, it's a little counterintuitive, but it's like what we saw before with marijuana, that even though this group stayed steady and this group stayed steady, overall prevalence declined quite substantially by about half over the study period because so much more of the adolescent group is now in this low prevalence group instead of the high prevalence group. Right? So 
Um, this decline of about 50%, you know, I'm going to project, we imagine a great decline did not take place. If the great decline did not take place, the parallel state would be exactly the same in 2018 as it was in the year 2000. This decline of 50% is entirely due to the great decline in adolescence and red smoking. So you guys working here at the T-Cores or whatever, looking at ways to prevent adolescent nicotine use and smoking, is also having this great benefit that I think uh, people haven't really realized as much that it's also bringing down use of other drugs as well, particularly benefits. Uh, I do the same thing for 10th grade and 8th grade. I don't present it here, it's, but it, you see the same results. Basically. It's something strong. So this is amphetamine use. <coughs> this is tranquilizer use. And you actually see a slight increase by about 1%. In this group, there's uh, actually a very slight increase in this, in this group too. But when you look at the overall group and you put them together, there is actually a decline. And if there had been no great decline in adolescent and cigarette smoking, um, there actually would have been a slight increase over this time period. So uh, this is consistent with the gateway theory. With the kids who are not smoking, um, they're not going on to use other drugs. They're, uh, as this group gets larger and larger over time, uh, they're sticking with their low prevalence. They're not moving on to use other drugs. And finally, we'll look at opioid prevalence. And so that's kind of an interesting one. Um, there was, you know, an opioid epidemic among adolescents. It's generally believed to have uh, subsided when you're, uh, uh, well, well, actually I'll show you the overall prevalence. Uh, the peak was supposed to be around 2004, uh, for the most part. That's if you look at the literature among adolescents, maybe 2006, 2007. Um, but what you see uh, is that actually opioid use in 2000, 2018, it's exactly the same, it's the same level, although there was this increase uh, during the time period. And again, uh, in the never smoke group, it's about the same. Uh, overall, it's, the, uh, it's decreased by more than half because of this great decline in cigarette smoking. Um, what I find kind of interesting here is that a lot of people attribute the beginning of the decline in adolescent opioid use so around this period here, when you see the first decline and it really begins to take off, um, actually even after 2004 or 2005, uh, use was still increasing here, and it's increasing a little bit here. Um, so it really seems like if you to try to tag an end period from the end of adolescent opioid use increase, it really should be around 2012 or so. And I think that's important uh, if you want to evaluate uh, what's happening in terms of policies, uh, national policies and trends. You need to know in terms of temporal ordering when the decline occurred. So I think here it's really more around 2012. Uh, and if you uh, do the projection, uh, if you imagine that there had been no decrease, then opioid use would have been the same in 2000 as it is in 2018. Okay. Uh, so my conclusions are the reductions of these three substances at the population level. From 2000 to 2018, resulted almost entirely from the Great Decline. Uh, this benefit is not widely recognized. Uh, I think it justifies and motivates efforts to continue and augment tobacco control policies, which, uh, to my knowledge, they're one of the few programs known to reduce adolescent use of uh, substance use at the population level. You come to somebody and say, uh, what's the national program we can use to reduce opioid use? There aren't that many that are known, but you could say, well, if you continue to reduce cigarette smoking and nicotine use, that is going to have an effect, because it does. Uh, and there is still substantial room for progress, because as of 2018, about 25% or actually percent of all 12th grade students had never smoked cigarettes, so we can still maybe get that lower, unless you think that some kids are just going to smoke anyway. I don't know, but it seems like there is definitely room for improvement here, even further. Uh, and uh, I also want to point out that cigarette smoking, uh, it seems to exert a population cost beyond just its direct, its, its direct negative effects on smokers. Right? Um, the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement of 1998, those financial penalties of $205 billion 
were based almost entirely on the direct health effects of smoking. You know, what lung cancer costs, health care costs, and cardiovascular costs, or that kind of stuff. They didn't take into account, well, actually, you know, additional costs from smoking are amphetamine use, and opioid use, and, uh, you know, stimulant use. And if you took that into account, you know, it could be quite substantial. Uh, I was able to find that in 2013. In one year, the cost of all illicit drug use was $271 billion. And I think a portion of that uh, could probably be attributed to nicotine use and cigarette smoking. So um, that was the second part of my presentation. Did you look at any more less commonly used uh, drugs like cocaine use or heroin use and see, did you see similar patterns? Um, well, heroin use, we find overall the prevalence of that among 12th graders is 1%. Mm -hmm. So there's not much room for movement there. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even they didn't really think about using it. I think it's for the um, cocaine use also has gone down to about 2%. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, even though we, we are a large survey, 45,000 uh, surveys per year, I don't think we're large enough. Uh, like that. I would strongly suspect that we would see the same pattern. You know? And what about other combustible tobacco use, like cigars, cigarillos? Right, yeah. <coughs> well, that's a good question. Um, I haven't looked at those. We could look at those. Um, I was kind of focusing on the gateway effect drugs, where you would use cigarette bursts. Uh, and kind of agreement that would start first before something like opioids. Um, and that's a little trickier with cigarillos, for example. I don't know which came first. Right? They're so collinear. They live together so much. I, I, I would take it to that kind of framing to look at that. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question, but I would have to frame the question in a different way. I'm not sure how. And how do you stratify uh, these trends in decline in these substances by those who are assisting on Economic disadvantage versus those who aren't. To see the trends decline are less steep among those who are disadvantaged. I think that's the next step, right? Yeah. So no, I, I have not done that. So would the decline in cigarette smoking be, like you say, attenuated mm -hmm. uh, among the, uh, the more disadvantaged? I think the answer is clearly yes, right? Because we know that as cigarette smoking's the interest became known, the upper class is able to desist from it. I mean, the lower class has been much slower in, in that regard. MTF doesn't have great information on uh, the whole disadvantage. We have parental education, mm -hmm. but we don't ask about income or wealth, for example. I was involved with a study in Wisconsin where they asked 12th graders, what is your family income? Mm -hmm. uh, and then later, they actually got tax records for those kids. This was long time ago when we get such things. And then uh, they correlated the actual objective tax records with the kids' report of family income. And the correlation was zero. <laughs> <laughs> so you can ask kids, how much money do your parents make? And they'll give you an answer. But it's not very valid. So, so that's why we don't ask that. So all we have is really parents' education, which is actually you know, pretty strong for smoking. Right? So it's not great, but it's OK. Yeah. Do you guys collect or make available um, information on the general, like could you use census data for like general areas and kind of the overall income in that area? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, well, well, yeah, well, let me see, let me rephrase that. So we are now releasing, if you get IRB approval, we have state level data. Right. So you could look at differences among all 48 states, that would give you some variation, right? Although it's a little bit removed from the actual school mm -hmm. itself, you want something closer. Yeah. We actually, you know, have the address of the school, um, and uh, no one's asked us for that yet, right? And uh, what we would be able to do, I think, if you ask me, talk to me, email me, because we're on, you know, we're only recently have been making the data more available, right? And I want to make and what we could do for you, Jessica, for you, and <laughs> um, like what we would require, and actually I think some of you are doing this for someone. Uh, uh, we would ask you uh, to provide us with a list of like all the income levels of census tracts in the United States. Or actually the census tract information, we have them already, right? Uh, and then we would link that to where the school is located, right? So you could get the income of 
level of that school, or maybe the surrounding tracks too, I don't know, whatever you want to do. And then we could give all that to you. And then as long as you're saying, a one unit increase in income leads to a such and such increase in your outcome, that's fine. But if you start starting to say, well, this school, you know, we, we can't let you do that for our identification purposes. But if you're looking at, at correlations, um, then that's fine, then we could do that. Yeah. So that's kind of a long answer. The answer is yes, yeah. um, but it would be a little involved to talk to me, uh, but we, we can do that. Okay, good. 2.30, so we have till 3, is that right? Yes. That's right, so I'm not going to make it to 3. Um, so, I mean, we'll end before 3. So you can all get to your next <laughs> stuff we're talking about. Um, so the third part is vaping. And like I said, this is much less developed. So I was just kind of curious, well, if we do the same kind of analysis that we've been doing, if we do it for vaping, what do we find? Right? I mean, aren't you curious, right? I mean, what if instead of looking at cigarette smoking as um, our stratification, right? what if we looked at vaping? Um, and so I looked at that. So I looked at cigarette smoking as consequences of use of other drugs. Does vaping act in the same way or not? Um, and so one of the first preliminary questions would be, is the use of other drugs higher for adolescents who never vaped as compared to those who have never vaped? Because right? we saw that those who smoked problems were like five times, four or five times higher. And what the projections of drug use look like if vaping had stayed at 2015 levels, which is the first you know, we asked about vaping. And so we have a question about overall vaping. So vape is to use a device but just this year, we added the Juul example. We don't have that. We have some we've added that in half of our surveys this year, and half we don't, so that we can assess whether adding that example actually changes the response levels. Um, but we asked, we say the babies use a device um, to inhale vapor in the lungs and they ever vaped. So this is our question if we ever vaped. Um, in grade 12, um, this is the percentage of adolescents who have ever vaped. So it's about 35% in 2015, and then it goes up to 42% in 2018. I have to say I was kind of surprised, but I thought it would be more than that. That the increase would be sharper, right? Because for 30-day use and for past 12 months use, right, we saw that uh, in 2018, we saw the largest increases we've ever seen in the history of MTF for any substance. And here it's, you know, it's not it's substantial, but it's not that big, right? So that well, kind of threw me off. I wasn't expecting it. Um, do, you, do you know why? Uh, do you know why? Yeah, because they like Juul. Because they like Juul. It's they keep doing it. They keep doing it. Right. right. So these guys it's here. It's not the draw of trying it. Right. It's like people are trying a little bit more, right? Yeah. It is a trend, but right. they. Well, once they're trying, yeah. they keep doing it. Right. Whereas right. then once they take a puff, and they're like, yeah. oh, I don't know about this. Right. Yeah, back here in 2015, when the devices weren't so good, mm -hmm. they tried it, they gave it up. Here they're trying it, they keep doing it. If we can just do the paper right now, that's a yeah. great paper. Okay. The 30 right. day to ever, um, you know, kind of comparison across time. Yeah. Yes. Right. But you could, I'm I up mean, for it. You would also use the panel data to look at that more specifically, right? Like, among 12th graders, how many of them keep vaping a year later? Yeah. And yeah, look at how that's, that's changed true. over time. And that'd be super. Both. Right. Yeah. You can use yeah. both. Yeah. Well, this is. Turned out more interesting than I thought. <laughs> I already did a play. Okay, right, that'll work. So, um, so um, what we saw here, this is the percentage of kids who are ever age. And then we're looking at marijuana use prevalence um, by ever age and ever age. And there's a substantial difference. It's three times higher among those who have ever age. Yeah. Do you specify nicotine or marijuana? For this, I did not, right? Because I want to go back to 2015. Back then, we didn't ask about specific substance speed. We do in 2017 and 2018, but we, uh, but we didn't back then. So if I wanted historical trends more than two years, I had to use this more basic measure. So we do see that there is this substantial risk factor for marijuana use if you've ever made. This is the overall prevalence. When the vaping hadn't changed, and you know, it's not that different, I have to say, right? And a large part of that is because we saw earlier there wasn't 
there isn't a huge change in the percentage of kids who vaped, right? And with cigarettes, we <coughs> saw that huge decline, right? Here, it's not nearly as substantial. Um, and if you want to look at amphetamine prevalence by vaped and never vaped, here it's less than 1% among those who have never vaped. It's, uh, you know, 40% among those who have never vaped. And uh, this is the overall amphetamine use, and if you use that projection, it's basically the same. Right? So this is why I was kind of downplaying the calls. Um, there's not a huge effect when you look at it this way. There's still interesting questions, right, like ever vaped, and, but, um, and then you can look at tranquilizer prevalence among those who have never vaped and never vaped. Um, you can look at the overall, and you can look at the projections, and they're all pretty similar. And then finally, you can look at opioid prevalence um, among those who have never vaped and those who have never vaped. And um, the projections in the comments. So, um, my conclusions drug use, drug use is strongly stratified by ever vaping status. I think that's consistent with the strong overlap between vaping and cigarette smoking. So we saw that cigarette smoking is really a strong predictor of drug use. And I think vaping is the same way because there's such overlap between those two. Um, but ever vaping status has not changed much in the last four years. It really surprised me. Um, as, especially not compared to cigarettes. Um, and therefore, changes in every use of vaping have less impact on use of other drugs uh, as compared to cigarettes. And that's it. Good questions? Or? Yeah, can I ask you, so did you ask if there are uh, what people's perceived risk of vaping was? We ask perceived risk of e-cigarettes. Because we first asked that in 2015, we wanted to look at trends. Um, so we've asked that since 2015. Uh, and then in 2017, we started asking about perceived risk of vaping nicotine regularly. So we wanted to update it. So the answer is yes, we've asked about it in different ways. Have you looked at it? Um, oh, let's see. Um, we have looked at it. And, well, we've looked at trends over time and it hasn't changed now. So perceived risk of e-cigarette use uh, is like, I think, 10%. It's one of the lowest of all the perceived risks of any, anything we ask about. Right? Kids think that there's no risk at all associated with that. But interestingly, if you ask about perceived risk of regular use of nicotine, uh, it's like 15%. It's like 15% higher. So it seems like uh, kids see a difference between, they don't, I don't know what they're thinking really, but when you ask about e-cigarettes, they think those are safer than vaping nicotine, right? But yeah, I, I, I haven't yet tracked trends in perceived risk of e-cigarettes and trends in uh, vaping or e-cigarette use. But that's in large part because uh, the trends have been pretty steady. It's, it's really low and it's stayed low and hasn't been as much. Do you look at the role of flavors and risk as it relates to e-cigarettes? Flavors? Yeah. Uh, we have not. Um, until I met up with Adam and Jessica, and so we're asking about those, we're asking about flavorings for the first time in 2019. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking back to how you said this great decline is sort of tapering off in recent years, yeah. um, and how it's a bit of a problem if we've seen such a positive um, impact on other substance use. Um, but you also mentioned that there's still a lot of work to be done, and yeah. that we can get that 24% even lower. Um, through policy change, so um, you gave a couple examples, but what other policy do you see um, contributing to those numbers? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So I personally think that part of the reason the great defense tapering off is because of e-cigarette use. Because kids who use e-cigarettes or vape are four to five times more likely to experiment with cigarettes and to use cigarettes. So I think if we came up with a policy to discourage vaping and e cigarette use among adolescents, I think that would help us continue the great decline in cigarette smoking. Right? And I have some thoughts about that. I'm glad you asked, right? Um, there's, of course, a big public health debate about whether vaping is good or bad for public health. For adults, it seems to be a very effective, at least relative to other methods, smoking cessation aid. Right? But among kids, there's very little benefit at all. So there's some people in public health who are like, well, we have to do whatever we can to make these e-cigarettes and vaping devices available to adults, and we shouldn't restrict their use at all. This is a long answer to your question. Right? Um, so what I propose is a tax on vaping that's linked to levels of use among adolescents. 
So if you have a device like Joule and the level of use of my is zero, then the tax is zero, right? But if it turns out that uh, revenue from adolescent use is like two billion, $2 billion a year, which is I think probably what it is for Juul, then you get a tax of $2 billion, right? Uh, so in this way, uh, we would still be able to make baby devices available to adults, um, but to the extent that adolescents start using them, the companies are going to lose money, right? Mm -hmm. And I am still perplexed about why it is that schools, school teachers and parents are the ones that are trying, we're char they're charged with the idea of trying to prevent kids from vaping. Using e-cigarettes, while the companies reap, you know, reap in billions of dollars of profit, right? We should make the companies the ones that should figure out how to keep adolescents from being, right? And I feel quite confident that if uh, there was an incentive for them, that if, or a disincentive, that if, if 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 they were able to reduce adolescent vaping and get more money out of it, then I think they would figure out how to do it. Right? So I wouldn't put the onus on them. So anyway, it's short um, short answer to your question. I think we should tax vaping, and I think it should be directly um, correlated to the tax with levels of adolescent use. And the beauty of this is that you could use NTF, the National Youth Tobacco Survey, and we can tell you what the adolescent use levels are, right? Because uh, we're nationally represented. What we get are the same findings that we get if you interviewed all 12 million uh, high school students in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so we can tell you what the use levels are, and that can be used to set the tax level up. Would it be like an annual analysis that you do, or would it be what, the, the taxation? It'd be annual, every year, yeah. yeah. And like if, if use went down among um, adolescents in one year, then the vaping company would be really excited. Yes, our profit's going to go up. The public health community would be really excited as well, because, you know, adolescent vaping is going down. Yeah. You may have shown this and I missed it, but did you look at vaping prevalence by smoking status? I did not show that. You know, uh, I have a paper uh, that was just published last month. It's in this minor journal called Addictive Behavior Reports. It's okay. like a new thing that they have. Um, and it has that information. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't say minor journal. It's a smaller, <laughs> it's a smaller <laughs> new journal. If it gets rejected from addictive behaviors, they didn't happen with us with preventive medicine, preventive medicine reports. Too. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't even try it at <coughs> first because it was like a non-finding and those are very hard to publish. You know, there's nothing, you know, it's just more like a descriptive thing. So. I have like a general question, uh, Richard, about like the, um, the analyzing trends and kind of tracking it, um, the reductions in smoking. Um, so the when this kind of started out, uh, you talked about how the um, risk is going down, right, for marijuana, perceived risk of marijuana, right? Um, and then so it's like a conundrum, and then something has to explain the conundrum, and then the biggest thing that's happened in adolescent drug use epidemiology is that, right? Um, yeah, yeah, right? Um, and so it kind of like makes sense when you when you look at the big picture and you look at the trends in the graphs, right? And I haven't read the paper, and so I don't know what the kind of nuanced analyses that might have been done are, right? Um, well, that's it. It wasn't nuanced. That's it. All right. Well, that's all you need for like a policy maker and you know um, to uh, um, make make the point, right? But so many things happen during that time that aren't just related to smoking. And so then when you start applying it to um, other drugs of abuse, which may or which may not show that, um, what do you call it, that dissociation, like, you know, kids think amphetamines are risky and they continue to not use them, right? You don't see that same kind of, one sloping upward or downward and the other one staying the same, right? Like that, you, do. you don't see, oh, so, you do, so you do see that like perceived risk of amphetamine is going down over time? Like marijuana, you know, that conundrum? Yeah, with marijuana, the yeah. serious went down. Yeah. Right? But, in, but, but like with the same. But like with amphetamines, right, um, risk has pretty much stayed the same. And, and, and use stays the same, right? And, and use, use stay a thing. Well, okay. it actually declined. Well, actually right? declined. Right, overall, okay. because of 
Oh, so you might see yeah. so you might see this across. Okay, because what I was thinking is that like uh, the basically you you're you're kind of talking about uh, cigarette smoking as the mediator, right, of the trend. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. But like it's a causal compound. Like, it is. You know? yeah. But we don't. It, there could be other stuff that happen and that travels with smoking, right? right? right. Um, and so um, maybe the middle paper or the last paper, like if you could start sticking in the other drugs yeah. in the models and you kind of had um, like a quantitative expo, like you know, like you were able to analyze smoking prevalence as a quantitative variable over time mm -hmm. and then show that, yeah, you know, it tracks much more closely with cigarette smoking than the, um, it tracks with, you know, opioids or tracks with, you know, no, no, alcohol. No. Alcohol's gone down too, right? It has. No. Yeah. Right. And so, alcohol's a gateway too, but you know, right. but that might be compelling scientific evidence to show that, you know, really is smoking is like kind of right. the major cause right. here. Are you, are you just proposing to rule out other drugs as having the same effect? Like to sort out that it's just the decline in cigarette smoking that like explains What's happening with cannabis use? Yes, and, and the other, particularly the other drugs. I think like cannabis use probably it, it, it does probably not all of it, right? right? But um, you know, definitely a meaningful proportion. But you know, for the other drugs uh -huh. that may be where it's less um, marked. Right. You know? Well, this is exactly the kind of feedback I want because I could easily imagine a cranky reviewer. Um, say, <laughs> say something like that, or a very smart reviewer, I put it that way. Smart and cranky. But yeah, I mean, because I, I agree with you, there are lots of other things that can be co-occurring at the same time. Right? I just single out smoking, but maybe something else is occurring. I don't know what that would be exactly, right? And um, but it's still a possibility because I, you know, this is observational data. I can't rule out all unmeasured competitors, right? And there's just no way to do that. I think the smoking story is a pretty compelling one, right? Especially when you stratify that and you show that it's been the change. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that home with me. I'm going to think about that. I, I might do the same thing instead of by smoking by alcohol use, right? Mm -hmm. and, see, yeah. and see what I find. And I should have that at the very least in my back pocket so that when reviewers come back and ask me about that, mm -hmm. I'll be able to have a response for them. Uh, I know for the for the uh, marijuana one. If you look at the paper, actually, it's not just smoking, smoking and alcohol. So I think both of them are simplified oh, okay. here, right? Um, but then it turned out that smoking was running everything. Really? Right? Wow. Wow. It didn't it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but I should be able to do the same thing with these other drugs. Um, and at least we'll note that somewhere mm -hmm. in the paper. Uh, I appreciate that, because that's that would be a round of reviews right there where I have to go back and revise it. So I'm, re I'm really interested in the variables in general. Um, and there's huge variation at the state level. California, we don't have as much of an opioid crisis as say if you're looking at Ohio or something. So yeah. if you look done the same analysis, like just at the state level, and yeah. seeing if the curves are different. Um, well, that's a good question. And MTF is designed to be nationally representative and not state representative. And so what that means is we can look at California actually, because California is the largest state in terms of population in the United States. We have about maybe 40 uh, high schools in California, which is enough to start saying the maybe it's representative. But all the other states, we don't have enough. Like, let me give you an example. Um, Indiana, uh, in some years, we get a, we survey intentionally uh, a school in Indianapolis. But in other years, the major metropolitan area for that area is not Indianapolis, it's Milwaukee. Right? So in some years, we have schools in Indiana, but we intentionally <coughs> take any in Indianapolis. So it's hard to say that those results are representative in Indiana because we didn't include the major city, right? Um, so we can't really do state level analysis. It, you know, people ask us about that a lot. And I need to come up with a response. You know, uh, I just got an email from Mississippi actually where they they want to know what schools we have in Mississippi and can they draw inferences about the state of Mississippi as a whole. We can't because Mississippi, there's 3 million people in Mississippi. That's uh, less than 1% of the population in the United States. We have 400 schools every year. 
Um, so about 1% of our 400 schools are in Mississippi, so that's maybe four schools, more like, more like three schools. And you can't take three schools and say, this is what Mississippi yeah. is, right? Um, and there's other issues as well. And sometimes our areas fall between street boundaries that we're sampling from. It's just a kind of random chance that it's in one state or the other. So another long answer. Um, but you could look at California compared to all the rest. But I don't think it's going to work for any other states. And California wasn't really like a big opioid. I mean, not like West Virginia yeah. right, or Ohio. Yeah. So it wouldn't be the best one to look at, but that was even easier. Okay, well, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Oh, <laughs>